I want to thank the organizers um, for kind of bringing us here together and um, having stimulative discussions. Although I had to admit that I was a bit scared uh, by the logo that, the, that was chosen by the organizers because it reminds me of dentist appointments and I'm typically scared of dentist appointments. But I think the things are getting um, kind of positive if you look at this smiley face on this tooth and he's actually waving as, I, um, as, as you see it, a positive spin flag um, kind of exciting all of us and bringing us here together. So thank you very much, uh, dear organizers, for coming up with this logo and bringing us here together. Uh, I also want to acknowledge funding if, by the German Science Foundation. And uh, as we will kind of go through the talk, you will notice my electron spin resonance, a priority program here situated in Germany, uh, plays a role, um, as well as the cluster of in, uh, excellence nanosystems initiative in Munich. Um, we heard an extremely beautiful introduction today about the entire um, topic. Uh, and I will give you kind of my personal motivation, uh, which uh, yeah, drove me into this field. And uh, I have to admit that I was um, yeah, extremely kind of impressed uh, by all the advantages of quantum optics. And if you need me to uh, draw one sketch, um, and we have seen this sketch today before, uh, about the main yeah. emphasis of quantum optics, I would uh, kind of go in sync with Kan Ming and kind of depict a cavity, an optical cavity, and draw in a two-level system. And for me, that is the representation of uh, the prototypical light matter interaction where, where you can make use of it. And we have discussed already nonlinearity factors and um, uh, how this also results into quantum information processing or how is this is important for quantum information processing. Um, luckily, at some point, and I think it was around 2000, uh, the solid state physicists joined uh, this field. And I think we could contribute uh, decently to the field of quantum optics uh, by uh, either kind of arranging quantum dots in photonic crystals, uh, coming up with uh, artificial um, um, atoms uh, here superconducting one into a microwave superconducting cavity or realize other uh, realms of um, quantum optic um, Hamiltonians by combining here mechanical entity with uh, an optical cavity or a microwave cavity. And the kind of impact that we brought in were in particular uh, higher coupling strengths and this gave then rise to uh, kind of new insights into the, the, the kind of more complicated um, Hamiltonians, so access to new physics. Uh, but for me, as a solid state spectroscopist, I, I always think of kind of can we learn more about the solid state and can we use it for sampling applications. So I think these are also two important points. So what I want to, so what my story is about is basically replacing this two-level system uh, by a multi-level system. Um, and the idea behind is that we will use light matter interaction um, here from, first of all, a generic photonic field with a, a spin degree of freedom. Uh, and I will mainly focus today about this effective coupling strength and how this comes about and how you can uh, manipulate it. I want to kind of spend a word why this is interesting from an uh, application perspective. Um, I think quantum technologies is... Uh, kind of, in the meanwhile, a strong leading field and is kind of almost drifting off to the engineering stage. Um, but one of the kind of problems still to tackle is kind of um, long range communication between quantum information nodes. And one of the um, things that people envisage is say, that they want to use superconducting quantum circuits, which typically operate in the microwave regime and then up convert it um, to an optical signal. And uh, what you could envisage is that you come here with your quantum signal, kind of use strong coupling to yeah, convert your photon, your microwave photon, to a spin wave excitation, to a spin excitation, and then read that out, uh, for example, optically. And so this uh, storage and conversion of quantum signals uh, is, I think, uh, a topic which also kind of drives this field. The other one is kind of, uh, sensing related, uh, or the question is how can we 
efficiently access the spin degree of freedom uh, and kind of do spectroscopy with this. Okay, um, so what is my photon box? Um, Kan Ming showed his photon boxes. I want to show you uh, our photon boxes. Um, we have this fabry perot cavity and we typically use planarized um, microwave resonators. So what we do is we take a silicon chip, we uh, deposit niobium or aluminium thin films on top of it and fabricate either with electron beam lithography or optical lithography these um, uh, coaxial structures. So you can envisage this as a kind of planarized coaxial line. You see that here is basically a break in the line and here's a break in the line which are kind of resembling mirrors and so you see the analogy between this Fabry Perot optical cavity and this um, yeah, mirror, two mirror cavity in the microwave domain. So you have here a standing field pattern and if you want to see such a cavity in real life um, then I see, show you here an optical micrograph. What we typically do is we have here a microwave feed line and couple capacitively a microwave um, resonator um, onto it. So this is one type of microwave resonators. The other type of microwave resonators that you can think of is uh, in a, an electrotechnical sense, an LC resonator. So you have here uh, a coiled up inductor and here a planarized um, capacitor. Both of them work yeah, in a kind of similar high Q fashion. Uh, and it uh, depends on the implementation that you want to achieve, uh, which um, of the two uh, you want to choose. Okay, what about the spin systems? Uh, my naive picture, and this is the zero order approximation um, um, of a, a spin ensemble, is that you take n spins, uh, which are here depicted by the green arrows, and you construct all of that a total a spin angular momentum, and if you do so, you end up with uh, a spin of n over 2, assuming that these have a individual spin of um, s equals 1 half. Uh, and so um, this depicts my naive picture of a macro spin model, and uh, what I want to discuss with you in terms of real systems is uh, spin ensembles, and one is a paramagnetic one, and one is an exchange coupled one. So phosphorus doped silicon in yttrium iron garnet. And I'll try to um, show you the differences um, and the different physics that are involved um, in these systems. Okay, if you apply a magnetic field, you can break the degeneracy of this magnetic quantum number and you can introduce uh, magnetic dipole transitions um, or you can think of it in uh, an harmonic oscillator picture, you can either say, yeah, my magnetic quantum numbers range from n equals minus one half to n equals plus one half, or I can number the, the excitations from zero, one, and so, and so forth, and, and so forth, uh, till the, the kind of n plus one state. And these are all equally spaced, um, which makes it uh, in the low excitation regime a perfect harmonic oscillator. So, the kind of fun part or kind of more complex part starts when your excitation number hits the top. Um, then um, this um, yeah, harmonic oscillator becomes more spin-like, so to say, um, and you see um, yeah, deviations or the actual spin nature of this harmonic oscillator. Okay, so what about the coupling? Uh, we just rely on magnetic dipole interaction. You can write this uh, in uh, second quantization, so you have to compute B dot M, uh, basically, and what we end up is our two harmonic oscillators um, and the coupling term. And this coupling term, as it was uh, beautifully related to, um, is kind of denoted as a single spin coupling times this uh, square root factor of N, which allows to boost um, um, the coupling. So, um, the kind of main theme is how can we manipulate this M and what is actually encoded in this N? So up to now, my N um, kind of counts the number of spins in my sample and I just want to show you that this is not the full truth. Um, I'm coming originally from a electron spin resonance background, so I was uh, puzzled with this description, uh, seemingly, because I learned in my PhD that you can um, exert coherent control out of a spin system. So you can 
apply pulses and say, okay, I take my spin system, I do a pi over two pulse, I kind of prepare it in the equatorial plane. I can do all this magic uh, pulse techniques for finding out coherence times of the spin systems um, and so on and so forth. And typically you use also a cavity for this. Um, the thing is, and this was uh, for me beautifully laid out in, in this seminal work, um, is that you have to be careful about um, the excitation numbers that you pump into your system. Um, so if your number of excitations are large, and large means large compared um, to the kind of here example of n spins, then you end up in this uh, regime where you uh, have a scaling um, vis uh, of the Rabi frequency, or here the driven Rabi frequency uh, with the drive power. Uh, so this is kind of proportional to the microwave magnetic field strength. Um, if you are in the low excitation regime, um, then you are basically living here, and there you have your square root n vacuum Rabi um, splitting. Um, and um, I will make today use of basically both regimes uh, for my paramagnetic spin ensemble, because there it's kind of way easier to implement. There are other troubles here from the techn technical perspective, uh, um, and I will basically focus on this part for the exchange coupled systems. Uh, to give you some numbers, uh, we heard it, uh, typical numbers are 10 to the 10 spins for phosphorus doped silicon, 10 to the 16 spins uh, for uh, the iron garnet systems. Okay, so let's start with the paramagnetic system. Um, I chose a particular one uh, and mainly because of my personal laziness. Um, the kind of neat thing of phosphorus donors in silicon is that they are well behaved, they can be well controlled, um, you can make them extremely long coherent, and therefore uh, you have kind of more time to play with them. Uh, what you should kind of have in mind is that it's a uh, paramagnetic spin, electron spin system with an S equals one half. Um, which is localized um, at the donor side. The donor side is the phosphorus donor, which has a nuclear spin of I equals one half. And just to kind of give you um, the spectroscopy intro for this, you would write that as a single spin Hamiltonian, as a Zeeman interaction, um, giving uh, or kind of denoting the energy splitting by the magnetic field. And you also have to take into account this hyperfine interactions connecting the electron spin and the nuclear spin. To give you some numbers, this hyperfine interaction is roughly half a microelectron volt um, or um, 4.2 milliteslas in, in separation. That's for an EPR spectroscopy the same thing. And the, the kind of simple picture is that you have, you have this electronic wave function, you have a finite probability of finding the wave function at the site of the nucleus. And so this wave function overlaps gives, gives you basically um, this energy separation. You can plot this as function of the magnetic field, so the eigenenergies as function of the magnetic field. We are typically operating in the high field regime, and so we expect two magnetic dipole transition, a low field one and a high field one, as the signatures of this individual phosphorus donors, as we call them. We measure in a dilution fridge, you will see in a second why, um, and uh, we kind of can do now pulsed um, excitation um, and uh, continuous wave excitation of the system, as well as continuous wave detection and, and pulsed um, detection of the system. I skip all the details. Uh, I want to refer to this uh, gentleman here, Stefan Weichelbaum, as he's sitting in the audience, audience go to his poster, um, ask him all the nasty details why we do um, uh, things like we do it here. Um, and he can also tell you about all about microwave resonators and coupling of microwave resonators to spin ensembles or phosphor spin ensembles. Um, the devices uh, here at the mi mixing chamber uh, kind of mounted. You have typical temperatures 20 millikelvin to uh, 500 millikelvin or so. Um, and to give you, and this is kind of situated here in a kind of magnetic field. If you look at this device under test, we have now this kind of uh, lumped element resonators, we can kind of just plug on top of them this silicon samples, the silicon crystals, we just lay it on top and fix them down and then we uh, start with spectroscopy.
Spectroscopy uh, is similar to what Kan Ming showed to you um, in a color encoded scheme. So we have here uh, the test frequency from our vector network analyzer. We see that we have here a signature which we can attribute to one of the resonators. And then we step the magnetic field and we kind of run into this uh, kind of spectral features, uh, which are 4.2 millitesels apart from each other. And you say, okay, this is phosphor stopped silicon. What you also should note is that you see this characteristic anti-crossing that was introduced um, before, and you can read out of this kind of anti-crossing the splitting, and the splitting um, um, corresponds to this um, effective coupling strength. You see, um, Kan Ming advertised hundreds of megahertz. Here it's much more difficult, and this is just due to the low uh, spin density that we have here in the system. You can analyze this in a bit more detail by fitting a Laurentian lime shape to this microwave resonator. You can get out the, the, um, the, life, the, the line widths of this microwave resonator, the line widths of the spin system, which are pretty good here. And kind of this help, these two help you to, to get in a decent uh, cooperativity regime. Um, the neat thing is that there are more spins kind of hidden here in the middle. You can barely see them, but if you kind of do the kind of line width analysis, you see here uh, feed two features which can be attributed to dangling bond defects as a silicon-silicon dioxide interface. There are also phosphorus clusters. Um, this is kind of not kind of important what it is. The, the, the neat thing is that you have here a weak coupled spin ensembles next to a strongly coupled spin ensemble, so you can compare them back to back in one of the same resonator at the same temperature. That's what I want to use. Okay, so let's kind of revisit this coupling strength here. The, and kind of do the first sanity check. So I told you about this square root n dependence. Um, and you can measure basically this collective coupling strength by just measuring this kind of separation as function of temperature. And you see, okay, this goes immediately down. Uh, this is just due to thermal polarization. So you take the Brillouin function, you kind of calculate your polarization, then you kind of notice that if you want to do this with paramagnetic centers, you are better off at low temperatures. Um, this is uh, kind of straightforward to understand. So now comes the advantage of our um, paramagnetic center. And the advantage is that you can do coherent spin control. Uh, so we use now high power pulses in this kind of high power regime to start with our spin systems kind of in an initial state. We kind of place it into the equatorial plane. Then we can let it evolve. This is called a Hahn echo sequence, which is um, kind of well established since the 50s. And then you can do a so-called pi pulse, which uh, is a time inversion operation. And then um, the system refocuses um, and gives you an echo. And this is the standard technique for kind of measuring the coherence, the spin coherence of the system. This is what we did here. Um, so we expect an echo uh, at this time frame. You see kind of echoes for the two individual donors, also for the kind of weakly coupled um, center, um, centered um, um, paramagnetic spin ensembles. Uh, everything is fine. And then you let your acquisition system run for longer times. And then you say, ah, something strange happens. Because um, in the weakly coupled system, so this is kind of quiet, while in the strongly coupled system, there is kind of a train of echoes, which is kind of uncommon for an EPR uh, pulse spectroscopy uh, system. Um, and we understand that presently in the form that, uh, OK, um, we have a spin excitation which refocused, and now it builds up photons in this cavity. And this can, as we think, um, act as a initial stimulus for the subsequent echo. So this is our naive picture, um, how we explain this kind of multiple echo train. And you can then start to analyze this, the amplitude of these echoes as a function of, of its occurrence. And kind of ask yourself the questions, is this just limited by coherence time, or is there more to it? And the answer is there is more to it, because in this strongly coupled system, you effectively or efficiently kind of get your spin information out of the system to your microwave detector. So you have to take this into account. You can do so <coughs> by analyzing this uh, echo amplitude as a function of its arrival time. Um, you can do this for various pulse separations. You see kind of here this beautiful dependence if you kind of fit here an exponential decay. And we understand this now that 
we are either limited by the shear coherence time of the systems or by this um, effective uh, extraction rate uh, that we kind of um, get here in this um, strongly coupled environment. So there's more dynamics um, in this system, uh, which makes it actually nice to understand. And I think it's important for electron spin resonance itself because it allows you to effectively access also um, spin ensembles um, with, with a small amount of spin. Um, then um, I want to advertise the yttrium iron garnet. Um, actually, Tan Ming, you did a great job. Um, and the atrium iron garnet um, kind of gives you the opportunity not to work at millikelvin temperatures. You have seen for this paramagnetic spin ensembles, we have to go to extremely low temperatures to have enough spins, to have enough polarization to go into the strong coupling regime. You can be um, straightforward and say, uh, I have two advantages of, in a ferromagnet. First of all, um, we initially talked in the paramagnetic systems of 10 to the 17 spins. Um, now we take talk about 10 to the 22 spins per cubic centimeter. So you gain basically a power of 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 in spin density. And um, these are exchange coupled, so they, they form an eigen mode even decently at, at room temperatures. Um, so there's no thermal polarization to be taken into account, in, at least in an initial phase. Um, if you then choose for material systems, you end up quickly at yttrium iron garnet because it has a, a extremely narrow line width, so it's a so-called ultra-low damping material, which makes it fun to experiment with. We started this business and then we bought yttrium iron garnet. We were delivered with gallium doped yttrium iron garnet, which luckily has also a pretty nice line width. Um, the, the core message that I want to convey here is that you can engineer these iron garnets to your tailored needs. So if you want to have a lower um, spin density, you can mix in gallium doping, you can change this line width if you want to. So there's a kind of rich literature how to manipulate and tailor this, this spin systems. We did basically the same experiment um, as I showed before uh, in a bit, bit different setup, but we packed just a crystal on one of these meandering coplanar waveguide resonators uh, resonator A, and what you should see here is that this resonator A shows this pronounced anticrossing uh, of roughly half a gigahertz, um, while B and C remain um, untouched. D is kind of a spurious mode. You can then start, okay, say I, I read off here for 50 megahertz. That's one way of analyzing it. You can do the same thing as before. You analyze the line width of your microwave resonator as function of a magnetic field, and then you can extract from this data or from fritting an input, so-called input-output formalism, um, the actual um, relaxation rates um, of the system. Um, so this brought us into the strong coupling regime, um, um, which uh, made us uh, decently happy at that time. What else can you do? Um, uh, the question or the hunt is still, can we tune this coupling in situ? Um, and one way of kind of following this doping concept uh, of the iron garnets is to uh, replace the yttrium in the front here with gadolinium. And you should kind of keep in mind that uh, the iron garnet, um, the crystalline structure has uh, a lot of iron in it. So these are these uh, um, purple points on the A side and the D side, and these couple antiferromagnetically. So you get here a net, um, you, know, you can think of this as a net uh, iron sublattice, um, which can then also magnetically couple to this uh, C lattice site. The C lattice site is in the yttrium, iron garnet, the yttrium. If you replace it with gadolinium, you replace a spin equals zero system with a spin equals uh, seven half system. And this gadolinium then couples antiferromagnetically to this uh, um, iron sublattice or this iron net sublattice. This gadolinium is a so-called exchange boosted paramagnet. So what you can play now with is again temperature and if you kind of look at this green curve, if you go from room temperature basically up to lower temperature, you see that the sublattice magnetization of this gadolinium sublattice increases dramatically. 
And it's actually designed in a way, or nature gives it in a way, that you can tune between two regimes, mainly a regime where the kind of net sublattice of the iron winds, or where this kind of area is larger than the sublattice magnetization of the gadolinium, or a temperature where the gadolinium winds, so where you can um, really yeah, outperform or where the main net magnetization is given by, by the gadolinium lattice. Um, you see that more easily if you look at the total magnetic uh, moment um, of this system as a function of temperature. So here you're iron dominated, then you have a so-called compensation temperature around three, uh, room temperature where the net magnetization is zero and then um, we go on the rise uh, to a decent um, magnetization of 600 kiloamps per meter. Okay, and the idea is now that we can again use this for tuning our coupling strengths and try to understand that. How do we start this? First of all, you, you look out for collaboration partners, and so the uh, gadolinium iron garnet sample here is from AG Cytos groups, and we thank a lot for that. Um, and you start with squid magnetization as a function of temperature. You have basically what I showed you before, a strong saturation magnetization, and then we have here a vanishing or almost vanishing magnetization. So this is a log scale here, and then the iron uh, dominates um, um, the, the magnetization. And then we do basically the same thing as before, um, here now in a, um, for, for the technical details, in a Bruker uh, microwave cavity, so a commercial um, resonator from uh, uh, the company Bruker. Um, and you see that if you go to low temperature, so this is 25 Kelvin, then you see this onset of this uh, anticrossing. The spectra look a little bit different than before, uh, which is uh, due to the kind of data uh, analysis. Um, so we technically take a derivative uh, along the magnetic field direction. Um, you can compare 25 Kelvin with 110 Kelvin, so this is again the seemingly the weak coupling regime. And we analyzed all this data by fitting a two-dimensional, or in a two-dimensional form, this input-output formalism um, um, to, this, to this data set. Again, now you can get out the coupling or deduce the coupling from this. And the clever thing is to plot it as a function of the uh, effective magnetization. Uh, so what we expect is that G effective is uh, now proportional to the number of spins or to the square root of the number of spins or proportional to the square root of the effective magnetization. So what you would expect is a linear relation between G effective squared and this um, effective magnetization. Uh, and so this is uh, decently visible here um, with a straight line. Um, so this uh, already tells you that um, there's, there's this kind of tuning relation um, is well maintained. You can get more data out of it um, by kind of plotting uh, the, the spin relaxation rate or the, the cavity line width, the cavity relaxation rate here into the same plot. And you see that um, the um, effective coupling as function of temperature uh, for lowering temperature increases here, but in particular, um, the spin relaxation rate um, goes down and then is smaller than this um, uh, coupling rate, and this uh, brings you to this onset of um, the strong coupling. So there's a lot to learn here, and um, what I want to kind of emphasize is um, these various systems in the iron garnet system, they have kind of different properties also in terms of optics. So uh, I think we will see a lot of work coming in the direction of kind of exploring here different iron garnet systems um, for um, realizing this um, microwave to optical uh, interlink, uh, for example. So I think there's, there's a lot to, to gain here. Um, and with this, I want to kind of in particular acknowledge uh, many, many people who contributed uh, to the work or joined the road um, um, of the last years. Uh, I just uh, flash them. Uh, I think I don't want to go through all of, the, all of them in detail. Um, thank you very much for joining. And it is a really a, a fun experience working together with you. And I hope to fruitfully continue. Um, and with this, 
it's, I think, time to flash uh, the summary. Um, I showed you a little bit in the direction of phosphorus, uh, dopants, and silicon, mainly because I think that this is a nice test bed if we're talking about the dynamics of the system or an easier understanding of the dynamics of the system compared to the, to the magnonics part, um, as already Kanming also alluded. Um, I talked a little bit about yttrium iron garnet, our kind of initial footsteps, and then uh, moving to other material systems um, for tuning this effective coupling strength. So and with this, I'm looking forward for your questions. <laughs>